Hello, good morning all. Um, I'm Carla. Um, I'm a part of the team um, in the University of Stirling. And we're looking at pilo environmental investigations on Arthur's Seat, Edinburgh. In 2017, we received an invitation from Historic Environment Scotland, and our brief was to recover new information on the past environment of Holyrood Park in central Edinburgh. This is not difficult, really, because nothing at all is known for certain. What we have instead are some myths. In one of these myths, Hunter's Bog was thought to have been created by monks, needing a water supply for brewing. In another, that Mary, Queen of Scots, created it. Neither are true, as we will see. The hills have attracted many archaeologists over the years. It's only a short walk from the University, the Commission, and Historic Scotland. The density of finds is remarkable, 150 of them, representing all periods from the Mesolithic. The hill forts are undated, but we might expect late Bronze Age origins if compared to Trepain and other southern forts. The archaeological evidence include the find of Bronze Age hordes from the early Bronze Age on Dunsapi Crag and from the later Bronze Age in Duntingston Loch. But what about settlement? The hut circles recorded by R.B.K. Stevenson after the Second World War have not stood the test of time. They may not be there. And there's something else missing, we think. Edinburgh is the Athens of the North in this regard too. Plato described how the earth has fallen away all round. There are remaining only the bones of the wasted body. This is Winnie Hill, and what's missing is soil. You'll know that Arthur's seat was a volcano, and these are lavas. The lavas should weather to a rich soil, but here, the wind bushes grow in bedrock or very thin soils. And the soil appears to be here, but in the terraces. For our work, for pollen and sedimentological analysis, we needed a sequence of sediments which we could radiocarbon date. <coughs> we thought about sampling Duddingston Loch, but Duddingston is quite a large loch. And pollen blown into it doesn't come from Holyrood Park. It comes from the west and southwest, from places like the Pentland Hills and beyond. We did look <coughs> at Hunger's, Hunter's Bog and found that it was much older than most people thought. The deepest sediments date back to the last ice age, 15,000 years ago. But we also found that overlying pits of Holocene age had been cut very early in the Holocene. So we went for the Nsapi Loch, below the hill fort, and at the bottom of the long slope of Crow Hill with all those terraces. But I hear you say, the Nsapi Loch was created by Prince Albert. <laughs> there is a dam his workmen built. Not so. The loch is on Roy's military survey. So, we sailed forth in July last year and sampled a sediment core, but it was a very odd core. Try as we might, we found only 160 centimeters of sediment, and a stratigraphy unlike any we would expect to see from a lake. So very worrying for a couple of months to wait for our first radiocarbon date from the basal sediment. It came back as 5,000 306 to 5,215 BC, late Mesolithic, phew. So what was odd about the core? This is best seen in a measurement we routinely make, and here comes the science. <coughs> we measured the carbon content of the sediment at half centimeter intervals. The carbon is entirely organic here. 
In a lake forming through the Holocene, we would really expect this to be boring with no changes through the sequence. Then SAPI isn't like that at all. All the carbon content here is low, never greater than 50%. We can usually expect a lake to be around 65 to 70%. And there are periods when carbon content is much lower, which is determined by large amount of mineral grains being washed in from the slopes. So when was this happening? So far, we have only four radiocarbon dated half centimeter sediment slices. We are currently awaiting 13 more any day now. Unfortunately, we had to date the sediment itself because there are no plant microfossils, despite us looking for them very hard. Organic matter in a lake with inwash material or grains can also be reworked, but so far, our four dates look good, and we can cross-check them with independent controls. <coughs> this date is not a radiocarbon date. It is an estimate based on the lake chemistry and pollen analysis. Elements like iron, sulfur, zinc, and particularly lead, in conjunction with the pollen of beech, hornbeam, fir, and elm, all of which we think are 19th and 20th century in age. So everything about 160 <coughs> centimeters is what Prince Albert did and what we still do today. So there is a gap in the sediment record between the high medieval and the 19th century. And we think we can recognize at least one more in the Neolithic at around 230 centimeter steps. There may be more, we're not sure yet, but in such a shallow lake, where water depth is only a meter, we think the loch dried out every so often. So what controlled when the Nsapi loch accumulated with sediment, and when it didn't? We're not sure, but we can explore this from our geochemical records. <laughs> These come from what it's called micro X-ray fluorescence. It's a terrible word to pronounce. A boring gray box, which rec records the concentration of elements every half a millimeter. Here we're showing smoothed curves of elements, which indicate erosion of soils and sediments, silica, titanium, chromium, rubidium, and nickel. All of these can be shown to have originated in the lavas and vent agglomerated of Crow and Winnie Hills. They are delivered as mineral grains and not from atmospheric deposition. We are currently waiting on grain science analysis. The final curve simply adds all these together and then corrected or enriched to take account of fluctuating carbon contents. What we think has caused this erosion peak at 160 centimeters <coughs> was the laying out of Queen's Drive in 1846. Soil erosion has been declining since and has been low for many decades. Something historic environment Scotland should be pleased about as they are worried about footpath erosion. But the soil erosion below 195 centimeters older than AD 650, was as big, and sometimes much bigger, than in the 19th century and Prince Albert Swartman. Below AD 650, we can see two sustained soil erosion events. The first one, from 5000 to 4500 BC, during the Mesolithic. Then we think there is a gap in the record after 4100 BC. We're waiting on the radiocarbon dates to confirm this hiatus. Sedimentation starts again at around 2400 BC. The second episode of continuous erosion is recorded from 1900 to 1400 BC, with a peak at around 1750 BC. 
and then sustained to around 700 BC. What's going on here? To try to understand, we have to look to our pollen data. This is the Dansapiloch pollen sequence. And here is our first late Mesolithic disturbance. In the Mesolithic, we have a woodland of hazel, oak, and elm. But we also have Scots pine, which we weren't expecting at all. There's also aquatic vegetation. But there are hardly any open, grassy spaces. So we have no real clues as why to why the slopes were eroding. This gives us a, an approximate image of what we think the Sapiloch might have looked at the time. Everything is much clearer in the Bronze Age. All the trees have gone, except older around the loch and hazel on the slopes. What replaces the trees is grassland, and we see a rise in grassland taxa and, coincidentally, first grazing indicators. Our first cereal type grain is recorded around 2500 BC, but more are recorded between 1900 and 1500 BC. Older was gradually lost, and then both older and hazel are gone around 1500 BC. But before this, there is quite an extraordinary episode of burning. You can see big bits of charcoal in the sediment. And we are currently quantifying this microscopic charcoal. There is no doubt that the fires were on the slopes around Nsapi. And what was burning? It is hard to tell exactly what, because the trees are not abruptly lost from the pollen record. So they weren't clearing the trees using fire until perhaps after 2550 BC, when hazel was impacted. There's no increase in ling, kaluna, which burns easily. So it may have been the understory that's being lost. Interestingly, however, the first pollen grains of wind Ulex are recorded from circa 2250 BC. Ulex is an insect pollinated taxa, which means the plant is underrepresented in the pollen record. And we know wind bushes burn really well. We think that the abrupt start of this microscopic charcoal peak is caused by the hiatus in sedimentation. Even though we may not be able to identify when this episode started, the fires were almost certainly set by people. Is this when the terraces were constructed? We start to speculate now. Fires set by early farming communities broke out on the slopes above the Nsapiloch <coughs> from the late Neolithic, as people were trying to clear the scrubbier plants. This will have included hazel, but older trees growing by the loch were not impacted. After 2400 BC, the burning affected the stability of the soils on the slopes. Soil losses by 2250 BC, somewhere on the slopes above Nansapi, led to wind bushes colonizing soils, reduced by erosion, maybe on the gentle deep slope of Winnie Hill. Soil erosion was seen to threaten farming. So around 2000 BC, the decision was made to control erosion by building ter terraces on Crow Hill, an, an unprecedented act. Where did the idea come from? Terrace construction led, ironically, to a peak in, in soil erosion from Crow Hill at seven, 1750 BC. We do not have evidence for what crops were grown in the terraces. This complex series of events also gives us clues as why to Dansapi Loch was sometimes a loch and sometimes dried out. As well as affecting soil erosion, Vegetation changes also affected water levels in the loch. 
more water is left on the slopes when trees are cut down and the basin becomes open water. This is a terrace system in northwest Portugal, where terraces were also built to address erosion. These are presently used for both pastoral and arable farming. Finally, what happened after 1900 BC is in itself quite extraordinary for anywhere in Scotland. Nothing happened. Everywhere else in Scotland, early Bronze Age woodland clearance, it's only short-lived. And the woodland, become, uh, the woodland comes back. This is not abandonment by farming communities. It's more a mobile population of farmers shifting ground, coming into focus, and then fading away again. But not on Arthur's seat. No one went away. The trees don't grow back. We think that the enormous labor investment of constructing the cultivation terraces was simply too high to allow them leaving. The burning episode stopped at 1900 BC. We don't think this is caused by a gap. It's real. For some reason, there was no need to continue burning. The terraces were used until 700 AD. Crop growing itself promoted some soil loss as terrace systems are in perfect sediment traps. The slopes were well managed and soil erosion was minimal after 700 AD. The cultivation terraces became pasture as they were until the 19th century. In the second half of the first millennium AD, the grassland seems to have been more heavily grazed and dunk feeding fungi are well represented. But Arthur's seat remain a focal point. It never lost its importance. We'd like to thank Historic Environment Scotland, to reach Rachel Pickering in particular, and to the Holyrood Park, um, Park Ranger Services for their help in what we've done. Thank you. <laughs>